I hope uh, you guys are enjoying the Snowflake Summit and you'll enjoy this session as well. So today, we are going to share our journey of building a scalable machine learning platform on Snowflake Ads, Samsung Ads. This is me, Akhilesh Richharia. I have been leading the data engineering and business intelligence efforts for more than a decade. I have joined Samsung Ads one year back. There I am responsible to architect, design and build our data infrastructure and data platform for our organization. Hi everyone, I am Ashwin, a machine learning engineer at Samsung Ads, focused on designing, building and maintaining our machine learning platform that caters to all in our entire machine learning life cycle. Um, I enjoy anything data and I am happy to be here to collaborate on the same. So this is the agenda for today. We'll start where it all begin. There we'll discuss our legacy system, what we had before the Snowflake implementation. Then we'll move on to what we have built to replace our legacy system. Then we'll cover what we have accomplished and the next step that we are going to use with Snowflake in our organization. This is us, Samsung Ads, and our purpose is simple. We deliver unparalleled results for our customers. As we are number one smart TV brand in the world from last 17 years straight, we have number one TV viewing data. This data is fueling our machine learning and analytics capabilities. With that, Samsung Ads is uniquely positioned to transform the advertising landscape. If you want to know more about us, you can visit us at www.samsungads.com or samsung.com. So before going into detail like how we have built a scalable machine learning platform, I would like to recall a machine learning flow. This flow consists of five different stages, which includes data collection, data engineering, data query, model training, and model serving. Your machine learning models are powerful because of the data they build upon. So in our organization, we are collecting the data from different sources. It is, it could be structure, unstructured or semi-structure. And then we are bringing that data to our raw data stage. And on top of that, we are performing all our data engineering operations. And then we are writing the cleansed data to the curation zone. This is Snowflake. And from there, all our analytics team, engineers, and analysts querying this data. Along with that, our machine learning platform team is reading this data, they are training their models, and then they are serving their models to the business. These models are capable to handle billions of bidding requests within few seconds. This is our legacy system. This is a conceptual diagram, what we had before the Snowflake implementation. So at the left hand side, you see we have devices. We have billions of devices all across the world, including smart TV, panels, smartphones. And these devices are interacting with the backend applications. These applications, are responsible to render the ads on the screen. Along with that, they used to publish billions of events or hundreds of terabytes of data every day to these storage systems like SDFS, S3, Columnar, and we had many more. At the right side, we have application teams. This team used to manage their own data capabilities most of the teams. 
So if you look at the overall diagram, the landscape itself look like a little bit fragmented. Let me tell you why. Because most of the teams are managing their own infrastructure and then their own data capabilities. Data discoverability and reusability was a problem. Let me give you an example. Machine learning team is using SDFS and operation team is using S3. Now operation team is looking for a data set. What options they have? Either operation team can bring that data set from source itself or they can search in SDFS or columnar. If they found that data set in SDFS, they will bring that data to S3 and they will use it. But in that case, it would be duplicated data at two places, right? Or they have another option, they can shift to SDF itself, right? So data discoverability and reusability was a challenge in this landscape. Cost management, of course, if you are managing multiple systems, it is gonna be difficult to manage the cost. Scalability, if you are operating within on-premises systems, and during the feature month, like Black Friday, there you feel sudden inflow. In that case, if you want to scale your system, you need time because you're not operating in the cloud, right? Compliance. This is very important if you're operating within the advertising landscape. And in order to run very heavy compliance job in multiple systems, those jobs are responsible to scan petabytes of data every day. And if you are running this job in multiple systems, then this system is not able to scale. So we had these multiple challenges. In order to address all of these challenges, we have built a platform using Snowflake. That we'll see next. This is our data cloud platform using Snowflake. If you see, we have devices, then backend applications, and they are publishing hundreds of terabytes of data every day to our data lake. And this data is growing continuously because our organization is growing like very fast. In our data lake, we have all our ETL jobs, all our Spark jobs, these jobs are responsible to translate that structure, unstructured or semi-structured data. They're cleaning the data and finally we are writing that data to our Snowflake data cloud. At the right side, we have multiple application teams. They are reading the data from Snowflake cloud itself. Now how they are reading? So we have multiple choice of languages that Snowflake supports. And for example, if one of the team using Spark in the legacy system, we have a replacement, we have Snowpark. If engineers are coming from the database background, there they used SQL, PL SQL, we have Snowflake scripting for them. We have Python connector as well, and we have multiple BI tools. If you are a data analyst, business analyst, you can use BI tools, you can connect to the Snowflake, and then you can build your dashboard. So this is the overall flow. Now if you see, we have a centralized warehouse that is in Snowflake, and this warehouse is single source of truth to our organization, right? We are managing compliance at one place. Data discoverability and reusability is very simple because of the one system. Right? Now, this is the flow how we are bringing the data in the Snowflake. Now, how we are using that data? What features of Snowflake we are using to build this kind of infrastructure? That we'll see next. So now we will deep dive into the Snowflake data cloud. This is the conceptual diagram of our regional data platform. Since 
we are a global company we have data all around the world and we have multiple snowflake accounts which are in amr emia and apac these all accounts are sitting under the one samsung ads organization there we have consolidated billing at one place for all of these snowflake accounts on top of that you see we have compliance layer we have regional compliance layer for each and every snowflake instance these compliance layer are responsible to manage and apply the regional compliance rules and on top of that we have our data consumers we have multiple teams like machine learning product finance marketing operation audience builder and we have many more teams they are reading this data from these regional accounts and they are building their reports they are training their models and they are building their dashboards in this ecosystem every team has their own dedicated warehouses and their own dedicated schema so they are operating within their own consumer space now let's take an example machine learning team they have 10 team members and they have different kind of roles so we are managing this by using the role based access control that comes with snowflake itself we have dedicated role for each engineers if they are performing different kind of duties right so if machine learning team has 10 warehouse and we have 10 teams so it will become 100 warehouse right and if we have three snowflake instance then it will become 300 warehouse if you are running 300 warehouse together in one organization how you are going to manage the cost snowflake has a very good answer for this object tagging we are tagging each and every warehouse there we are monitoring the cost and if the warehouse cross the threshold we trigger the alert and be notified to the consumer so they act accordingly then we are using storage integration to read the data from the object storage it could be s3 gcp or azure you can create the external table and then you can read the data if you do not want to bring the data in the snowflake itself this is like 5 or 10% in our organization for the ad hoc use cases then we have network policies in place in order to maintain the security and of course as i said we have regional compliance management layer if you look at the overall picture now if machine learning team want to consume the data they can connect to the amr emia and apac but they have to go through three different accounts and we have three different account because of the regional compliance rules now they need all the global data at a single place so that they can build a single report there they can show the global data global data platform so the difference here is instead of regional compliance layer we have a global compliance layer this compliance layer is responsible to manage the compliance rule that is common globally and then we are moving this data to a separate snowflake account that is global account and there we have global data and on top of that you see we have all our data consumers they are operating within their own space now in order to build this kind of infrastructure there you have to move the data <coughs> within the same region or across the region you need good capabilities if you build this kind of infrastructure with the legacy databases 
it is going to take months or years but with snowflake it is very simple it's data sharing and replication so when we are moving the data within the region we are using snowflake data sharing and if the, we are moving data across the region then we are using database level application now if you have petabytes of data in your system and this is the global environment and in your one table you have let's say hundreds of countries of data in a table and based on the roles based on the compliance rules you have multiple consumers so let's say you have a consumer john and he want to use us data only but in your table you have hundreds of countries of data what option you have you can create a view there you can have a filter and that view would be very specific for john or you can create a separate table for john but that is not going to scale we have a very good answer within the snowflake row level policies you can configure the row level policies for john and based on that you can just share one view to all of your users when they query the data they can only read the data based on the policies now the next feature that we are using is auto clustering and this is very important if you are operating within a system there you have hundreds of petabytes of data your table size is continuously growing every day you are putting 10 terabytes of data in a table and it is keep continuously it is growing right at some point of time it is going to be slow so you need table maintenance right so if you do the table maintenance you have to go either you have to gather the stats or you need to rebuild the table right but with snowflake it is very simple just go and enable the auto clustering it will do all the things for you and you can disable this auto clustering at any point of time next we are using snowflake alerts let's take an example you have a team that team is basically reading hundreds of tables they are writing their semantic logic they are aggregating the data and finally writing the data into a table and it is a scheduled task which is running let's say in every one hour let's say it is failed and you need notification if you are using any other orchestration like airflow or some other tools then you can configure those kind of alerts but you have the solution within the snowflake itself you do not have to bring up another environment and run your orchestration right just go and create the alert in the exception handling you can raise the alert whenever it is failed and it will notify you then as i told we are using snowflake task and snowflake has a very good ui there you can go and see all the your task dependencies you can create group of task you can put dependency so these are all the feature we are using within our platform now if you look at the overall picture and if i tie back with the challenges where we started now we are managing all our data at a single place data discoverability and reusability is not at all a problem we are managing compliance at single place right for cost management we have object tagging in place and of course we are operating in the cloud we can scale our warehouses at any point of time and we can disable them at any point of time if they are not being used right so this is the architecture of our global data platform now we are going to hear a successful story from our machine learning team how they are using this platform how they are doing their analytics and machine learnings with that i would like to invite ashwin and 
he will take it from here. Thank you, Akhilesh. So um, now that we have a data cloud platform over to cater to our regional and global needs, let's see how we can put it to good use for our machine learning use cases. So Samsung Ads uses machine learning to make our demand side ad platform intelligent. So our demand side platform, or DSP for short, receives a million requests per second. So it becomes extremely inefficient to respond to every one of these bid requests. So we need an efficient way to correlate each bid request to our advertisers' KPIs. These KPIs could be impressions, installs, and et cetera, et cetera. So here is where machine learning comes into play. We use machine learning to correlate these bid requests and see how valuable they are to our advertisers' KPI. So let's go over a typical machine learning lifecycle to see how this works. In order for good machine learning, we need good machine learning models and good machine learning features as well, right? So let's go over the life cycle. And I know you probably have visited like five different sessions today which talk about the same machine learning life cycle, but I'm just going to go over this real quick so that it brings everyone else up to speed, right? So let's consider Mr. Tony, not Stark, a brilliant engineer with a state-of-the-art idea to solve a machine learning problem, not Jarvis. So machine learning being data-driven, he goes on a journey, and his first step is to collect the data from different sources. He then does exploratory data analysis to extract meaningful insights from this data. He notices noise in this data, which could be very harmful for machine learning modeling, and so he goes ahead and cleans the data he needs to transform it, and then he needs to aggregate the data to create meaningful features. He then builds a machine learning model, which ingests these features and trains it to solve his business problems. Now, in order to see how his model performs, he needs a test set of data, and he also need a, needs an offline performance metric, which allows him to see how his model is performing. So he can then validate his model's performance, and once he's happy with the offline performance, he goes ahead and deploys these mo this model into production and monitors how this model performs with his business metrics, right? Now, this is an iterative process, and he needs to do this over and over again until a stable state is reached. But this makes Tony the bottleneck in most organizations. So in most organizations, we have domain-level experts who take care of every step of this life cycle. For example, we have data engineers who take care of ETL pipelines. We have data scientists who take care of machine learning modeling and training. And we have machine learning ops who take care of monitoring how these models perform and also deploying these models into production. So we quickly see the need for multiple teams to collaborate and also work together to build successful machine learning products. This opens up quite a few challenges for machine learning in scale. So in an organization like Samsung Ads, we have hundreds of machine learning engineers working on thousands of machine learning models, which cater to tens of thousands of concurrent ad campaigns, which deal with a trillion data points. Now with the number of variables at play here, it becomes evident how difficult it becomes to handle all of these parameters in a scalable, reliable, and cost-effective way. Hence the need for a machine learning platform which helps find the determinism in this non-deterministic space. So now let's take a closer look at our machine learning system and see how we have built that over whatever actually is talked about. So recollecting what Akhilesh said, we have raw data ingested into our data platform in batch. This raw data is exposed to us as Snowflake News. Now, this is really important because previously we had data scattered over multiple systems, as Akhilesh said, right? So when aggregating all of this data within a single platform, it helped us access this data very easily. And being views, we, we didn't have like right access to it. So it's easy to just have multiple teams query it, especially multiple members of our team, query all of these raw data sources within the same source. But just access to data and processing data at scale are two different ballgames altogether. So this is where we use Snowflake's warehouse to process terabytes of data at scale in a reliable way. So we also have the role-based access control, which is enabled by the data platform team, so that 
the right people have the access to the right data and the right warehouses. So our engineers use a combination of the raw data views. They can use that to analyze the data, and then they use the virtual warehouses to create these features all within Snowflake. But being early adopters of Snowflake, we quickly saw that it also became a problem for us to migrate all our previous Spark-based pipelines to SQL. This was mainly because we were forcing our engineers to use SQL to use our platform. And it also made it difficult to unit test SQL workloads when we were moving from Spark to SQL. So this went against our design goals to make it easy for engineers to iterate end-to-end -end from the machine learning lifecycle. So enter Snowpark. So Snowpark helped our developers use a language of their choice by pushing down this, all the heavy lifting to Snowflake. This enables them to work with data of any size wherever it is in Snowflake and still do the same processing with the frameworks that they're most familiar with. So if they use Snowpark to create the data, they still need an efficient way to train these machine learning models. So we use machine learning with TensorFlow and we use distributed training to consume this data in parallel and train these models on terabytes of data that are generated every day to create these models and store them in our model registry. So our engineers use these training instances through our machine learning training APIs that we've built in-house. So this makes it easy for them to deploy the training jobs rather than having to maintain it or like use the instances directly. But there is also one more challenge just with Snowpark and the distributed training way we have, right? We previously, we, had, we wanted engineers to actually access both of these things separately, and that made it difficult for engineers to context switch as much. So we provided them access to both of these through a single medium, Jupyter. So using Jupyter Notebooks, engineers can directly use our machine learning training APIs to deploy their training jobs, and they can also use Snowpark to do their exploratory data analysis and feature engineering as well. They deploy these features into our data cache for online serving. They also can deploy these machine learning models to their model registry, where they keep track of their versioning and experiment tracking. But again, we see the need for model engineers to deploy these models and the features to production easily. So this brings us to the third and final phase of our machine learning system, the interface between our batch system and a real-time system. So our in-house real-time bidder helps load the features from the data cache and also helps load the model registry based on the versioning required. And it helps serve these real-time requests, um, I mean, quite easily. In order to serve the request, we use TensorFlow Serving, and we also use um, open source tools like Victoria Metrics and Prometheus, to, and also Grafana, to monitor how these models perform in production. The synergy between our batch system and real-time system show how it is easy for an engineer from model inception to deployment. So basing off this platform, let's quickly go over how a data engineer would use, this, use the machine learning platform. So a data engineer would use a Jupyter notebook powered by Snowpark. He would ingest the data from raw data from Snowflake, and then he writes the data back into Snowflake or S3 STF records. They also use Snowflake warehouses so that we can, they can scale this process based on waiting workloads. And it's, this is very reliable to do this at scale. Once they're comfortable with how they do their machine learning uh, feature engineering, they then automate this process and have scheduled pipelines with Airflow, which runs every day to do the same process and, does, and, and pushes these features back into the data cache. So from this workflow, we can see four steps of the lifecycle being automated within the same workflow, the data collection, the data analysis, the data processing, and the feature engineering as well. Now that we have processed features that a data scientist can use, the, the data scientist still uses the same workflow as very similar to the data engineer. He then uses the Jupyter Notebook, accesses our training APIs, which can still which can use Spark ML or TensorFlow to train the models with distributed training, and they ingest the, mod, ingest the data from Snowflake or S3, and then save the model metrics back to Snowflake and also the model registry. So we use our model registry, as previously said, so that we can do some tracking with, I mean, each data scientist can track how their models work, and then they can also store the models in the model registry so that they can roll back if they need uh, appropriate, if, if they need to roll back at all. We also use TensorBoard for monitoring, 
which, so that we can see how our machine learning models converge over time during model training. Once he's comfortable with the hyperparameters that he's tuned, he's then going back and going to schedule the same airflow pipelines to, do with it, to schedule the training jobs, which then deploys the models to our model registry on a daily basis. So we've discussed about like how an engineer would train the model and also we've discussed how the features are generated every day as well. But during iterative machine learning, we do see some issues with deployment as well. So we see that we have new training data that is generated every day by our data engineers. And so new features created, which means there is going to be new data distribution. We also see our data scientists creating new models with different hyperparameters. And so this creates a lot of variation and we have multiple experimental models by the combination of the new data and the new parameters. So now a problem arises, like how do we know when we have multiple experimental models that if we deploy these mo one of these models to production that they're going to work better than production? So one way to do this is to create a testing data set based on the most recent data. And then we use like an offline performance metric that can directly correlate with our business metrics. And then we see like if we try to do inference with our experimental models and our production model, and if everything works well and our experimental model performs better than our production model, we should ideally deploy to production, right? But this more often than not has stumped us. We've seen that when an experimental model worked better in our local or like offline settings, we deploy it to production, we see that our business metrics actually performed worse. This was because of two reasons. One, the data distribution with offline and online were completely different. And the second one is that the offline performance metrics that we thought would correlate with our business metrics were completely off. So our answer to this was shadow deployment. So using shadow deployment, we run production traffic through our machine learning models in prod. We run duplicated traffic through our experimental models as well. So now we have both of these models serving bid requests simultaneously, but we only return or respond to the live bid requests from production models. But we still collect the responses from both these models and we store them offline. Now in real time, we can simulate based on the responses, how our experimental models would power our campaign metrics or business metrics. So this solves both the challenges that we discussed in the previous slide. We're working on the same live bid traffic that our experimental model and production models serve. Uh, we, do, we don't need to create an offline metric that correlates to our business metrics because we can see our, how the campaigns perform in life. So we've seen or taken some successful strides by adopting Snowflake for a machine learning platform. We've seen 64% improvement in our performance by adopting Snowpark, which allowed the pre-processing to reduce from three hours to one hour. We also see by centralizing our data within a single data platform, we have simpler access to data and it allowed us to make unit testing simple. It also helped us to like identify and fix data issues locally, which helped improve QA iteration time from four weeks to two weeks. And this improved our productivity by 50%. Moreover, during peak data load using, during feature month, we use Snowflake warehouses, which could scale very easily and quickly it saved approximately five hours per day. So this improved our overall time to market by 30%. By using Snowpark, we were able to push down our query down Snowflake and Snowflake's warehouses and enable usage of light, lightweight instances rather than our legacy clusters. So this also brought down our costs by 20%. So in summary, we've created a machine learning platform with highly scalable infrastructure, which is limited only by the cloud and of course, your imagination. We've enhanced the data access and discoverability by, by aggregating all our access to data in a single data source, Snowflake. We've improved the usability by keeping the platform as self-serve as possible. And we've reduced the errors by abstracting the compute. We have stringent security and privacy in place by enabling role-based access control. And we have backward compatibility by using Snowpark, which helps the engineers to work with Snowflake with the language of their choice. Finally, using our platform, We've managed to keep the deterministic aspects of machine learning as deterministic as possible, which means like any input that you have, like any data that you give as input, you get the same output, except for the machine learning models, which are non-deterministic in nature. But it doesn't stop here for us though. 
So in the future, we see a seamless integration between Snowflake and TensorFlow. And in order to do this, we seek to consume data directly from Snowflake using TF data. Or we plan to move our training the machine learning models within Snowflake so that we don't have any data transfer out of Snowflake. I mean, with no data transfer out of Snowflake, this would help us have all the compliance handled by the data platform team. With improved compliance comes the savings of cost as well. We also see the possibility to do real-time data ingestion using Snowpipe streaming and move our architecture to more of a Kappa architecture. We also see the possibility of doing federated learning, in which case we can train our machine learning models within Snowflake in all of our regional accounts and still share the models across each other, but not the data alone. So this brings us to the end of our presentation. I take this time and opportunity to thank the organizers for giving us this platform to collaborate and learn together. I'd like to conclude by saying, features maketh a model, and that's a snow-brainer. <laughs>